interesting fact on a quiz program. Do you know when the Holy Roman Empire ended? 1860, wasn't it? 1806. 1807. I had no idea it was as late as that. No, I didn't know. I have no oh, idea. <coughs> Yeah. <clears throat> and you knew that, Pete. Yeah I, yeah, I saw that bit as well. Yeah. Did you? Did, were you surprised? I was. <laughs> I was astounded. Yep. Yeah. Mm. I thought it was much, much earlier. I did too. Well, yes. <laughs> Would that be when the Ottomans took over in Turkey? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah, it was when Napoleon um, uh, was rising to fame. Yeah. And whoever it was, was it Francis, abdicated. Yeah, but I had no idea that the Roman Empire was still going. Mm. Well, wow. I know. Okay, yeah. Good. These last couple of days brought back some, uh, some memories from way back. Mm. Um. We were uh, one evening, and we were in the in my uh, my aunt's house, and we heard heavy traffic coming past outside. And we went outside to look, and it was uh, truckloads of American army personnel coming from a transit camp, going into Falmouth to be loaded on the ships to be taken away for the Normandy landings. Mm -hmm. And one of them threw me an orange. I'd never seen an orange. Oh, because it was during a war, we just didn't have that. No, no open and uh, I often wondered whether he actually survived and got back to back home to the states or not. Yeah, Peter, can I ask you a stupid question? What did you do with the orange? Did you bite through the skin or did you just peel the skin off? No, well, well, actually, we cut it up and shared it between us, cut it into quarters. Hmm. The, re the reason why I mention that is because my, my auntie. Uh, when when she had a banana, my grandparents had never seen a banana before, mm. and they gave it to her to eat because they thought that you actually eat, eat the peel with it. All right, yeah. Mm. So she so she bit through the skin, and obviously you can imagine. Yeah, um, horrible. <laughs> yeah, and, and she never she never touched touched bananas again. They didn't know what to do with a banana. No, sorry. How would you? Uh, yeah, how yeah. would you? So this is actually I'm thinking the, if it was a really nice orange, the peel would have been okay. My uncle that I was living with before the war, he, he, he had a vegetables business. He ran a lorry with a book and selling vegetables door to door. <clears throat> and so constantly he would have known, but then the war broke out and from that point on, we had nothing like that. And he couldn't get the, the fruit and veg. So uh, he stopped that and went to work in Falmouth Docks. Mm. Imagine trying to eat a pineapple with its skin. Oh. <laughs> well, the thing is, if it, well, the, the thing is, it really depends if it's soft enough, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah I say it was cut up in the four, and we actually we all had a bit of it, but it was so unusual. Yeah, very much. Mm -hmm. Very much. <clears throat> did you manage to see Country File with Flat Home? I did. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was good, wasn't it? Really, it was quite good. I'm a bit disappointed the way they did it. Yeah, with uh, bits with, and then, oh, then moving on yeah. somewhere else and then coming back yeah. and going off and coming back. Yeah, but yeah, our yeah. Uh, our uh, current chairman chair person was there showing the uh, the gold counting. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Bridget was there. Yeah, I oh, thought so you were the chairperson, Pete. Now I stepped down this year. I'm now oh, the right. vice chair. Do you still yeah, go and give to us that, though, Pete? But, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Yep. Yeah. I was a tour guide. I trained most of the tour guides that are there now. Yeah. But the big question is, Pete, did you train Linda? Because you, there's no way you could have trained her. <laughs> Nobody could train Linda. Mm. You tried and failed. Uh, no, no, I, I don't have that honour, mate. <laughs> oh, it was Hugh. It was Hugh in... Uh, Linda, they got me uh, into the archaeology with you because yes, we were going to uh, Asda's in Cardiff. Mm. We had the training, the training room there, and Hugh 
He was giving the lecture. Yeah. Um, he didn't do a bad job, I must admit. He was good, Hugh. The, pro the, the, pro the problem is with Hugh, he, he, he got really good towards the end and we just couldn't keep he him He did, on. he got better as he went on, he did, yes. Mm. Oh, oh. Mm. Yeah, he was a bit quiet when he started out, I found it not mm. clear. Yeah, mm. that'd be clear. I thought well, he knew his stuff. But, but, but yeah, no, I he think... did. He did know his stuff, and and the thing is, oh, yeah. he, oh, he, did. he got he got really really good. It's just that we couldn't keep him on. I know. I know. Hello, yeah. Interesting. So um, right, okay, um, right, all right. So um, so we 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 know, we know right that this um right. First things first, we, we, we're, we're going to start anyway. Um, we'll, we'll have some other news off anybody, but I, I wanted to um, I, I wanted to ask, can, right, can you give me the name of that site again, um, Margaret, of the Mesolithic site with the thousands of artefacts? Can you just give me the name of it again, please? Stainton, S-T-A-I-N-T-O-N, West. Well, and that's in Cumbria? Yeah, and it's northwest of Carlisle. Well, okay. Well, well, well I'll, I'll see if I that actually. It would it'd be nice to use a local example in Cumbria, to be honest. So that'd be good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we are doing gonna we are going to be doing hike today, or uh, housewick or whatever you want. We're gonna, that's what we're going to do. Um, and I did promise. I did <laughs> promise that um, Flint napping video, and um, I, I think the, probably the best way to do that is just to. Um, when we come in after the break, um, just sort of show the video and and because I, I know I know if I did the the video on the on the one device, you would be able to hear the sound, but I don't know what the sound's going to be like on the other device. So tonight we're also going to be looking at um, hazelnuts. Not not for the, not for the last time, may I say? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so um, yeah, the ha hazelnuts in the Mesolithic. So. So we look at a, a site from Sky, the Isle of Sky, and it's um, a University of Highlands and Islands project. So that would be useful. And I've got th three sources that I want to sort of overlap with the Hoyk thing to just try and bleed that dry of information. So uh, whilst whilst I'm doing a bit of mastication, right, um, I'm going to go through the names and I'm just going to... Um, Claire's gonna Claire's gonna say something, so we'll just go over to Claire. Claire, let's have news from you, darling. <clears throat> Nothing, sorry. Oh now come on, Claire. We're not gonna have another last week when nobody's got anything to say. <laughs> uh Claire, you know the rule, make it up. Right, okay. Um Andy. No, nothing. <laughs> oh come on. Oh I, I, well, I did no, a rescue I, I... about ten minutes ago, but other than that, no. Oh, that's did you? really yeah. interesting. Not really. It was a bit of a pain. Is that oh. people caught out allegedly getting cut off by the tide, but it's like a 7.2 meter tide, which for those who don't know RSG means that it just means that the river water goes in a different direction, but it doesn't really cover anything. So all these people, because it's a beautiful sunny day up here, have yeah. gone walking out onto the sands into the bay and they're going, oh, they're going to get cut off by the tide. And we're going, no, they're not. But so, well, they might. So we'll get the hovercraft well, out. Oh, right. Um, that's a bit exciting. Oh, yes. And, Did our bit. Got the other craft out, base search and rescue on the other side. They picked them up and took them back to Grange. And that was it. Good. Mm. Job done. I Job didn't know done. even know you had a hovercraft. We don't. It's the RNLI hovercraft from Morecambe. Right. They work with us because they're good lads. I can't even make this up, can I? Right, okay. Roger. Now, Roger, don't let us down. If you haven't got any news, just make the bloody stuff up. Go on, tell us, Roger. I live on the Roman site. <clears throat> what, what about it? You know, I've done nothing about it. But... <laughs> that's right. Oh, for, this is this is bad. <laughs> Where right, is that right, that's it. I've been on one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for Pete's, Pete's sake. Right, okay. Pete's sake. Right, Pete, have you got any news for us, darling? Not really, except to, to uh, as, as with Andy, we, there was uh, two people stranded on uh, on Sully Island again. Oh. And the oh. uh, reg, the uh, Coast Guard was called out. They called out the lifeboat to go and pick them up. Me, I would say I would leave them there. So the tide goes up. That's once hard. the tide goes up, they could walk back off anyway. But they were just, oh dear, oh, we're cut off by tide. 
and we'll never get home and blah blah blah, blah that sort of nonsense and oh, consequently they had to be picked up oh because the lifeboat can't turn it down and say no we won't i would but they can't yeah but the thing the thing is then they could argue well you didn't take us off and one of us died so it's your fault that's not anything they don't know Right, okay. Um, uh, what, okay, Margaret, anything else right. you want to say, darling? No, no, just the, the thing about the Stainton West that was quite interesting, but it's not new news, it's old news. Okay. All right, uh, right okay, Anne. I'm still reading my anthropology book and looking at warfare, and in a sense there's this feeling that these are very small tribes who are, are having war, and you might equate them to things in the past, but most of the tribes today are to some extent controlled by states. So it isn't quite it isn't quite a good analogy or a good example. But uh, even so, I think there is a little bit of uh, uh, what can I say information from that of how small groups, especially once they'd started doing farming, would protect and, and fight over it. But as I say, this isn't archaeology. This is me reading this book, which I mentioned last week. Well, it's, it's, it's all linked, my dear. Don't well, I do, I do think that yes, there is a link, but it's not quite the same. But it's, I, you know, I found the book interesting. I'm going on with it. <coughs> Thank you very much for that. OK, who, who else have we got there? Um, we, we got Drina. Anything you want to say, Drini? They found a new Roman, they've newly found a Roman road. Um, says it goes from north of Carmarthen to St. David's. I don't know if you know of that. Um, they, they reckon it could be the real golden road of the Priscelli Hills. Right, okay. That's north what they're the calling it. Yeah. Trading gold from Ireland. How the trading gold from Ireland? Even though we've got our own gold in Wales, right? Okay, that's an interesting one. <laughs> um, right, Roman. I'm just trying to type this in. Right, okay. And uh, anything that uh, Pat, you got to say something whilst I'm trying to get this thing up on the screen. <laughs> okay, I looked on my phone. There's always archaeological things coming up. I guess the algorithm thinks that that's all I want to read about is for news. Um, and there, <clears throat> this one's in Abu Dhabi. And there's a place called an archaeological park, a hilly, H-I-L-I, hilly archaeological park, dating back to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. It shows evidence of the ancient life once dwellings in the area desert. Um, these villages, burial grounds, agriculture infrastructure, <clears throat> and um, it was on also about um, irrigation. They um, had ways of getting water down, and um, they irrigated the area as well. So Abu Dhabi, who would have thought it? They have archaeology there. Yeah. Oh, that's why, really interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. No. Mm. Yeah, they got to picture some tombs that are still there, that are round. Um, I guess that's sort of, let's see, where's my, uh, there. Yeah, we can see that, we can see that, it looks great. Yeah, yeah it's a little blurry, I can't seem to get to focus in. Mm, uh, tombs, that's interesting. Ooh. In Abu Dhabi? Abu Dhabi, yeah. <laughs> Field trip. <laughs> trip. <laughs> yep, yeah, field trip. <laughs> Into the desert. And Andy, seeing as, Wales, seeing as Wales has now qualified for the uh, World Cup in Qatar, right, near. Yeah. <laughs> right, is Pete is prepared to um, yes. pay for the flights because he said he's got a lot of money. Pete did. Yeah, he's prepared Very to pay nice. for the flights, uh, mm -hmm. and he, he wants he wants a non-English team to win the World Cup. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, you did well to qualify. Yeah, well, 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 it, well. If put it this way, um, oh, yeah, some of you ain't gonna laugh at this following joke, but I gotta say it, right? Um, if if Wales can beat Ukraine, so can Russia, right? 
That didn't go down well, did it? Ooh. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Ooh, no, no, no. So, so, sorry. Nasty, sorry. That, nasty. That, that was really bad. I am so sorry. I, 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 Russia I, I, couldn't I, beat the blind school. Hey. Yeah, don't, don't forget you're live on YouTube as well. Oh, <laughs> my account, I've had my account thrown off now. Yeah. Right. So, uh, right. Okay, then. Um, I do apologise for anyone watching out there who's Ukrainian or Russian. Um, but that's life. Um, anyway, oh, uh, Baldrick didn't like that either. Right. <laughs> so, so what we're going to do now? I want us to, I want us to look at the humble, the the, the very very humble, very mundane, um, hazelnut, um, as well as looking at the site of Hoyt. Now. I do have some images, and I've do I've I've got some nice text. Um, hoi, hey, H O W I C K, and there's lots of really nice images. Now it's a site that I've mentioned quite a lot of times, and it's very very controversial. From finding the remains of um, dog bones there, which which could be signs that a, a wolf has been domesticated, and then some people argue that the, the remains of the dog could actually be. Um, a scavenging dog and and then somebody writes for example um, hoik itself is, is is a piece of evidence um, that indicates hunter gatherers were actually settled in a permanent settlement <clears throat> and you're thinking hang on a minute how does that work out how can you be a hunter gatherer living in a permanent settlement that means you're not no longer a hunter gatherer surely anyway oh. actually we had the, we, we, we did actually have a very, very similar problem when we looked at uh, the, the, the Japanese, because when we looked at early Japanese culture, I remember saying that, you know, 10,000 years ago, they, they've got these settlements and they're not really into agriculture yet. They, they're, they're into gathering at the same time that they've got settlements. So I, I think. I think when we use the words hunter gatherer, it's almost as if we're into the crudalities of trying to look at terminologies and fit them into uh, basically fitting a, a round post into a square hole, that type of thing. Uh, and I, I was I was writing a piece today. And I was was trying to sort of come up with with appropriate words for the movement of human beings that was called transculturalism and transhumans and all the rest of it um, and i started to think well why do you just say the movement of people it makes things a lot easier so what i need to do i i, I need to define where this site hoik is i've got loads of images but unfortunately that's one thing that i didn't manage to set up so i think we're going to be faffing around and, and working out where this site of hoik is so we've got all these images, which which is which is great, right? So we got that. So the next thing I want to do is I want to go with this here. Oh, we got hazelnuts. So that, that's the other thing we're going to be looking at today. Hazelnuts. Um, and if we if we type in um hoik and we think of location, I've heard this described as hoik um howick. Um is hoik. And if we sort of let's try and get a map where Hoik is, it really helps to. Um, and there it is. So th there we go. If we go on the Northumberland coastline and we we keep seeing that, that red dot. So basically, it's more or less on the border between Scotland and England. Now. The the interesting thing about when we look at descriptions about this site is that it uses terms like the site is along the coast and it was it wasn't too far away from where they were fishing. Um, or it uses terms like um, the site of Hoyt is obviously pure evidence that people lived on the coast. Um, in the winter months and lived in land in the summer months. And you think, well, that's not true because this site it would have been very far away from the sea at that stage. And then you've got other people saying it's a permanent site for the hunter gathering. So what I really want to achieve today is to try and give you a load of blurb and, and maybe let your own minds expand on it. And then 
we'll have that little bit of a break and then we'll we'll look at some flint mapping and then we'll look at some hazelnuts so it, it's it's all it's all good stuff um and if if my if my sort of phone rings um it, it's probably one of my children and uh you know so that's probably where we'll take the break so it would help be helpful um and this this is sort of the coastline of of hoik today yeah it, it it's it's rather interesting um and if we sort of chuck that in there as well this sort of coastline as it is today but this is not what it looked like thousands of years ago so what we would be good doing is if we go there and we maybe focus on the image and we focus on an archaeological excavation. <laughs> now, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a really intriguing piece of archaeology. As I've already said, I've probably given too much away. And Hoik. It's been extensively archaeologically excavated, and they've even done a reconstruction there as well. So if we if we sort of generally introduce it by mentioning some more recent work, and maybe ex ignoring for a couple of moments when it was found in 1983, sort of give you a bit of an introduction. So the site of Hoik, Howick, H O W I C K. Uh, was discovered when amateur archaeologists found, found flint tools eroding from a cliff um, on the Northumberland coastline. Now, this this is a clue, isn't it, that the, the site is being eroded by the sea. Um, and we, we, we then think that the, the site itself being discovered in the 1980s is being extensively excavated. And this is a team here, the University of Newcastle. Excavations in 2000 and 2002, and there's been other work before and after. And one of the one of the key instruments of the reason why they're working there is that the site is going to be eroded into the sea and lost forever. <laughs> that is, in fact, a clue to the fact that the, the site was, in fact, quite some distance away from the sea. And obviously, out off the Northumberland coastline, it would have been part of the extension of Doggerland. So we, we feel that the main feature on the site could be described as, as one of the first major indicators of a habitational site outside the cave, outside a cave setting found in Great Britain. It's, it's, it's one of the, the earliest sites it's not the earliest site, it's one of the earliest sites of a settlement outside um, that was occupied in the Mesolithic period. We do look at Star Car, but not stay. There's a building there, there's a hut, whatever, whatever you want to describe it. And we've got some really good radiocarbon dates from, from the hearths inside the hut. And some of the very earliest evidence that we've got is, is actually. There's actually some of the bits of the building, all the stain in there. Some of, some of the earliest evidence that we, we have from the site dating wise actually comes from the hearths. <laughs> whoever's got whoever's got their phone on, can you just please switch switch the thingy off? So so the site itself dates to at least nine thousand eight hundred years ago. So that's 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 really in our that's really proper into our period of the Mesolithic period. And it makes Howick could be said to be the earliest occupational site in Northumberland and one of the earliest in Britain. And it's key to trying to understand what's going on in the Mesolithic period in Britain. And what we do do in archaeology, we, we, we make a lot of small bits of archaeological evidence, but now we're not in the area of small bits of archaeological evidence. We're, we're now in the area of finding buildings. What I mean by that is when you look at the Paleolithic period, 
we we're making a lot of of, of a bow a, a deer bone with a bit of a carving on it and we're making a lot of a paint in a cave and we're, we're making a lot of a burial in a cave and so on but now you've got a lot of information um, from just this one site now the, the 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 big danger is trying to interpret this site and let, let's sort of um maybe look at this reconstruction here so they they've done a proper a proper reconstruction uh, the the danger looking at this building is is maybe thinking well all buildings all buildings looked like this in the mesolithic period and that th that is the danger you know what what did what did a, a house look like in the mesolithic period and you know it, it's just like thinking well you know um my, my screen seems to have frozen Hang on. okay we're frozen on that minute uh so is is this the be all and end all is is this is this what what they lived in um and the answer is we, we get other evidence at the other site known as Star Car, which is not far away um, from Yorkshire. And we look at this site and we think, actually, and we're going to have to try and hang on. Oh, there we go. That makes things easier. A little bit more of an image there. And, uh, you know, the site itself is is not not alone within the world of archaeology, um, because what what has been found is that uh, we've got this Mesolithic site, and and around it is a Bronze Age um, cemetery, right? So thousands of years apart. So the site itself was subject to detailed and meticulous excavation involving geophysical survey, field walking. The analysis of, of the finest levels of, of data, as we will see with the, with the same work being done on hazelnut, hazelnuts, for example. And, and basically what we do see is that we've got a landscape perspective. So before we go on to this in sort of a little bit more detail. So we one thing that we do need to think about within archaeology and if we sort of go back again, is, is and what you can see is, is the building there. Um, and you can, you can get an idea of sort of an overview, what is going on. And, and you, you, all these little, little squares on the ground sort of indicate a grid where they're excavating. Now, I just wanted to go into a little bit of detail because of, of archeological techniques. Years ago, and I haven't, I haven't really discussed this in in a long time. Years ago, we used to think of archaeology as individual sites. So we used to think of Stonehenge. Uh, we might think of the Ring of Bodga. We we might think of Avebury. We might think of Tinker's burial chamber. We might think of Castle Rig. Uh, we 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 might think of these these sites as individual things, but one of the things that they used to do in the past that, that they didn't used to think of the sites within an overall setting. And what we are now, what we have been doing for at least thirty years, is we've been basically saying, look, you know, to try and understand this site, we've we've got to field walk, not just at the site, but but around, and we've got to collect material that's been eroded to see and look at other data to try and get this site to fit within the landscape because it's within that landscape that you actually start to understand archaeological sites it, it, it's within the sort of hinterland and, and the broader appeal of the landscape that you need all these archaeological techniques and th this this was one good thing with time team and as some of you know time team's back um, this is one thing that we saw in Time Team was that they basically looked at a site and they 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 looked at the landscape and everything. Geophysical survey is really important. By putting this site into a um, into a landscape perspective, you're understanding it understanding it a lot more than just one single archaeological site. And when you put it within the landscape, what you then make do is is the landscape is is starting to talk um, and. And one thing that we do find, all these little hollows here, um, all this evidence of these halves, 
um, if you can make out a circle there with with this is basically um, the, this building that we are looking at all the staining. The staining itself tells us all that staining there is is, is evidence of fires, is evidence of movement, is evidence of changes. And what we what we do find is the site itself was used for a hundred years. That to me is a site that's permanent. It is is at least used for at least a hundred years. And archaeologists, what archaeologists wanted to do, and, and we'll we'll go into my notes about this. They 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 wanted they they, they wanted that feel that you know th this was used temporarily, and now we know that that's not the case. And and every single now this this is one technique that I actually use myself is is every single piece of archaeological data is recovered by sifting the soil and which is going to be very sandy uh, using flotation tanks and finding shells and finding all the sort of minutiae of archaeology so the, the, I, the, there's another point that i need to put across as well when you, when you when you thoroughly research an archaeological site to the detail that they've done with this site inevitably the archaeological data is going to be stacked quite high so what we mean we're fine we're, we're finding everything right in comparison with some other sites so what i'm trying to get at is that sometimes when we are very intense in archaeology there's more data and then you then you excavate a medieval site and there's less data because you haven't sifted the soil, you haven't looked through everything, you haven't put it through the same process. So inevitably, archaeology is very biased, and this site is very biased because we've got a lot of information from it. Hazelnut shells, halves, we've got bones. So, so they they undertook this this ex very experimental reconstruction of a building. And uh, I'm just going to try if we can get some of the images that I got in front of me. Um, where is it now? Where is it? Hang on a minute. Doesn't seem to be on this page. So, what 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 they've got is they've got another. They they have got another. Um, I'll just make sure that ah this one here. So if I get these images up here. Um. Uh, yeah, I think this is it. It's some nice. Hang on. We we will go through all this now, and hopefully this will show some of the reconstructed drawings. Or is it the next one? Yeah, we're going to do that. Hang on, this sort of um, point excavation, just to see if we can get some of the some of the images that I'm looking at here. Ah, here we go. There's the reconstruction. Right, so so they 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 started uh, reconstructing it, and obviously, what we do find um, is that they 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 use different techniques because that one there is obviously not the one that they ended up on. This is the one that they ended up on, um, and is is that reconstructing the past is is all about trial and error, and we will we will we'll look a little bit more detail of this. So by looking at all the evidence within the archaeological um, context, within the archaeology, <clears throat> by looking at all that evidence and, and the post holes in the ground, by making a reconstruction, it helps you understand and interpret um, what was going on. And, and basically, they, as I said, they, they did two reconstructions, that one and that one. And this is the one... That one there is the one that they, they're showing the images at. Because if we go back to, if we that's the one that they show the images of, not the other one. So they did two different reconstructions to try and get an idea. And, and it's just trying to faithfully, the biggest problem is reconstructing, for example, reconstructing this building near the coast it's not going to perform as well as a hut that was built inland. And what I'm getting at is back in the day, this this building would have been away from the coast, right? It would have been miles away from the coast. So by braving a reconstruction along the coast, it's going to deteriorate quicker. 
Um, but then again, this is the nature of the beast. That that's where the building is. It's near the coast. So we think we think of a this type of construction, a, a TP type frame, of of birch poles, which provide the basic cone shape. And that's what we're looking at. And again, it's it's not it's not a difficult structure to build. It's really not um, for somebody that's that's building a roundhouse myself, but not not on this degree. So we've got basically the cone shaped side of this, and these were reinforced with a ring of uprights and cross beams using thick pine logs. So if we if we go back to if we go back to um, the reconstructed image again. So if we go back again, it keeps on losing, keeps on losing those images. Hang on. I'm just going to see if that's the one there. And oh, here we go. Um, nope, that's not it. I did have the images not so long ago. Um, because that did actually show it, didn't it? Um, Right, there we there we go. That's that's that. So what what you can see what they're talking about. You you've got these the TP frame with the birch birch poles. These are birch, the ones on the screen, the the, the grey ones. And, and then then what you've got is you've got these uprights. There there's these uprights, um, and then they support a crossbeam, which is a lintel, and then um, that sort of reinforces the whole thing. So. I think it's describing that it was done. I, I, I don't. That seems like a strange way of building. I would say that the that the um, uprights were put in first, and then the cross beams, and then the TP frame. But they're saying they're rather interestingly saying that they're using pine logs rather than all birch poles. And I would argue <laughs> that you wouldn't have enough pine around at that time to actually use pine logs. So the final structural elements were spars, which locked the structure together. So the spars themselves are, in fact, if we if we go back again um, and we go to that image, and ba basically, um, oh, it's got lots of lots of them now, haven't it? Um, the, the spars are basically, this is the other design. The, the spars are the other sort of, um, you would call them tenon, um, uh, purlins, purlins. So, so these basically, this links it all together. And then the other thing as well is, it was decided to construct the roof out of turf. Now that's rather interesting. Constructing the roof out of turf. There it is. And... As the robust timber frame had clearly supported a heavy roof covering, it is possible that the original roof may have consisted of a combination of turf and reed thatch, with the soil facing out um, and uh, reed thatch pinned to this, creating an insulated, waterproof, and flame retardant roof. Then it goes on to say, <laughs> there we go. The reconstruction was undertaken in four days during which the weather fluctuated from blazing sunshine to what one would expect um, from this latitude. This, however, did not deter the team of volunteers who helped reconstruct a hut, and they managed to do it in one single day. Uh, one single day, in four, in four single days. So just this building, four days, that's great. Um, and, and obviously, it, 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 it's all about um, building something sim simple with an insulated roof. Um, and again, there's lots of experimental versions of these buildings that have actually been reconstructed. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to look again at the archaeology. And there they are, a fairly, fairly big excavation area. And again, if I, if I look at my notes now, and we go with this. So thinking, thinking, thinking aloud, and then then we'll sort of do a um, a bit of a conclusion on, on this. The Hoyk Mesolithic House um, today is alongside a striking 
Northumberland coast. Back in the day, it would have looked out on a valley with, 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 with various different animals um, that people could see from this site. And obviously now it's alongside the coast. Um, it's, it's above a limestone and sandstone cliff line today. And again, one of the biggest reasons why they started excavating here was simply because the site was going to be eroded into the sea. Just a little bit before, a little bit behind that, there's the drop. So you know, it's 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 not far it's not far away from that. Um, it it does look a little bit away from the the sea, but it, it's saying it it was in danger of being eroded away. So the, the site itself was found by an amateur archaeologist, a John Davis, in 1983, by complete accident. And this is because some of the 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 Mesolithic flints, which included those those telltale signs in the Mesolithic period, those microliths, and some blades eroding from the site. And whilst I whilst I break, did um, did people get their chart via email? Did, did you did you get did you get a, um, a timetable I sent you all? No. Oh, I was there, yeah. No. 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 You didn't get it. No. 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 Oh, weird. Well, oh, okay, okay then. I'm just going to um, make sure you get this. Hang on. I sent one to you, Andy. You're on the list. Um, and 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 had and had one sent. Roger had one sent. Which email address did you send it to, Carl? The one with an end, one with the after Pringle. There's a number eleven at the, at the end of it. Yeah, no, that's the right one. I haven't got it. Oh no, beg your pardon. It is here. Ah, oh, there's me looking at my computer, and you have got it. Oh, yeah, I've got it. No. What did you, you send, know, it, Carl? What's that? When did you send them? This morning. Oh, sometimes mine come a bit late. Anyway, those those that don't have a copy of the is, is that timetable you asked me to do. So that that's there. Anyway, the reason the reason why I, I broke the lecture then was because I remembered <laughs> that I sent you that, and also it mentions microliths on it. That's why. Uh -huh. So I'm rather interested in this sort of obviously erosion. So so. Yeah, you know, these blades were discovered. So, I, I'm I'm taking a I'm taking a guess that um, even though that looks green in the summer months, that must be exposed in the winter months, and hence why they're they're, they're worried about this being eroded. Mm. Um, and then the discovery of more flint artifacts uh, being discovered in January 2000, 2000, and then we come back to this woman called Nikki Miller Milner. Of Newcastle <laughs> University, which is a name which is familiar because Nikki Milner comes up when we look at the Star Car excavations. It does say again, it, it makes this thing about the site demanded an urgent investigation as the erosion which had led to its discovery presented a very real threat. Um, and again, I'm just I'm, I'm I, I, I can see what they're talking about when you look at it from there, right. Um, the, the coast looks there, and then when you look at it from there, the coast looks much further away. Yeah, it's on the left there. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the site demanded urgent um, investigations because the real threat of being eroded away. It must be down to, it, it's talking about not just sea erosion, there, there's a real danger of, of land slippage. Some areas of the site were already damaged by slippage down the cliff edge. And in that year, and July 2000, a three-week investigation took place. A test excavation showed that there were there was archaeological remains below the reach of the plow. Plow damage had, had extensively damaged the site, um, and the evidence being found at that point presented was flints, charred material, and they actually undertook various geophysical survey there, in, in, including um, magnetometry which basically means that the magnetic resilience res um, of hearths, for example, that, that's got a level of magnetism. So again, looking at, um, if I can, if we're going to type in this now. Looks like it's quite high on the hill, surely. 
Yeah, it does, but it's definitely they, they're still talking about erosion being quite substantial. Is that slippage, wasn't it? Yeah, slippage. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, it it basically it what's happening is you've got coastal erosion and then you've got slippage of the site, um, and and we've got a nice little site. We've got some site plans now, so. Um, right. Right. Hang on a minute. It's not very clear. This one. Hang on. Okay. See, see what 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 they've got. They've um, no that right. They there you go. You got the how how um, excavation there. You got it there, and it's very near the coast. But you've obviously got the slippage, and then what you then find is that you've got the archaeological excavation. Right, so you, you can see you can see on that plan that, that um, uh, you do have a concentration of archaeological evidence in the middle and some kind of ditch there, um, and you can see the cliff alongside, and, and that's that's talking about the slippage associated with the site, and obviously looking at another plan, um, and it's talking about that that's it's, so it's, it's relatively near the close coast. And it's talking about a hill fort as well nearby. So, so the, the the landscape itself is is very. There's a lot going on. There's there's early medieval, there's Iron Age, there's Mesolithic, there's loads of stuff going on. Um, so there's full excavation in June, August 2002, and obviously other stuff going on. Field walking, as we've already mentioned, trying to find evidence on the beaches and elsewhere. Test pitting. Um, digging test pits in different areas to try and get an idea with the extent of the site so you might sort of um, put test pits slightly north of the site or you you might put them south of the site you know you, you you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have these little test pits everywhere a test pit is basically we call it a sontage is is a meter by a meter pit that you dig in a field and you might dig down half a meter to just to see if the, if the archaeological evidence in those test pits has anything to do with the Mesolithic <coughs> site? Well, they also did. They they did sediment coring. They 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 worked out that this at one point, this area had a glacier on top of it. So twelve thousand years ago, uh, you know, this was glacial, glacial landscape, um, and the soil was very rich. And 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 the color of the soil that you can see at the site today is as a result of of that glacial sediment that has been left. So they did lots of soil analysis and they, they undertook this sort of large scale open area excavation. Um, and again, I, th I think I think the terminology of if we go back again. I, I think. I think one of the things that they're that they're really getting at is the importance of this site. But again, be very wary about what I'm just about to say. So. The Mesolithic excavations at this site are some of the most detailed Mesolithic excavations ever undertaken in Britain and, in fact, Europe, right? So because they were so detailed, it's biased because they wouldn't be undertaking that level of intense archaeological excavation anywhere else because they had the money to do it here. Mm -hmm. But what what we can what we can say is that when they had opened up the excavations, as you can see in front of you, as I've got in my my description here, um, that, that there is there was lots of flint being found, a series of pits. You can see lots of pits on the screen. And the thing is, um, the biggest problem with this type of archaeology is that there's loads of pits and there's loads of holes, and trying to match up the holes and post holes with an actual building, and that's the problem. Uh, there's lots of stains, lots of stains from hearths, lots of stains from other activities, and act actually lots of stains from decayed timber. Now, that's really interesting because, remember, this site dates back over 9,000 years. In fact, 9,800 years ago. Um, and it's rather mm -hmm. interesting that you still get evidence of decayed timber um, at this site. Mm -hmm. So it became clear that the main feature of the site was a substantial circular structure, um, which was about six meters in diameter, which is not a small building. Now, they they started to rule out that this was not uh, just a 
temporary structure, the evidence indicated that people had lived there for at least 100 years. And unfortunately now, bits of the site have been lost due to slippage and that it was good that the archaeological evidence and the archaeological excavation being undertaken at the site was compelling to help us understand the Mesolithic period. So what, what they what they do find is on the edge of the structure were defined a, a line of stains in the sand. So staining in the sand, um, a, a roughly circular staining in the sand. And the stains are all that remains of ancient timbers. It is possible that the dwelling was rebuilt on the same site more than once as the original timbers had decayed. So we've got a succession of different post holes from different times and different periods. And the building would make the building looks like it's got a sunken floor because it, it's all sort of looks like it's a little bit lower there and a series of deposits. Um, and they believe that initially there may have been up to half a meter of deposits at the site. Obviously, that's been eroded away. And a sequence of various hards. So hards from different periods were found across this site as well. As you can see, the 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 the, the, the image. Mm -hmm. It's so confused. There's so much going on there. It's, it's very difficult to interpret from one moment in time. So when we go on to the other notes that I'm going to do, it, it, it does give you an answer to the following. Now, the reason why I'm doing these classes like this, bringing in different information, is it's good to find out what different people say about the archaeology. <coughs> so the, the, these people writing this piece um, based on uh, notes from the um, Newcastle University and so on and elsewhere, um, these people have not made a decision whether the site was a permanent site or semi-permanent or even seasonal. So it seems there were no considerable gaps between occupations. So in other words, the occupation layers were thick. There, there was a lot going on, as, as they say, initially, half a meter of, of archaeological deposits which which was estimated that the site would have had which is a lot of occupational evidence in fact over more than 100 years now the biggest thing that we are going to look at after the break is hazelnuts um, not from this site but the isle of sky and it discusses that the hazelnuts themselves are not only indicative of of being able to date the layers on site hazelnut, hazelnuts are the limpets of the hoik site they they they, they found hundreds of them um, there was no no doubt thousands and thousands of them at the site initially. And what we've got, we've got occupation layers, which which not only contain these these hazelnuts, so actually contain flint, ochre, mm -hmm. shell fragments of bone. And the last, now that says that the burnt bone from the, from the halves shows the presence of wild pig, fox, birds, and, and either, as I've mentioned, a domesticated dog or wolf. Now, it's been argued in the past that that, that 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 wolf or a dog may have actually been a scavenger on site and was, wasn't actually de de domesticated in the first place. The dwelling is truly ancient and truly very special. And it's so special that they, that they undertook 33 radiocarbon sets of dates from the site. And the last time I looked to, to, undertake, to undertake a single radiocarbon date, that's, that's 200 pounds a throw. So they must have had a lot of money to radiocarbon date this site. Um, and they got 33 radiocarbon dates from the material at the site, um, given the earliest possible site, uh, the earliest possible date of when the site was constructed, of around 9,800 years ago. So the High Kais is the earliest dated human settlement, well, one of the earliest sites, because Darkar would argue that they've got one of the earliest sites there. So what I'd like to do is is the last bit before we have the break. Um, and again, um, this is this is basically a little little bit of a recap. And, and what I might do is is then after the break, mention the charred hazelnut shells and all the other. So we'll do this little bit, and then we'll do a little bit more of hoik after the break, and then. We'll we'll look at that video, and then we can then look at these these hazelnut shells. Mm -hmm. So the Hoyt House is the Hoyt House. Just to sort of recap, today is along the sandy cliff face. Investigations found a circular 
uh, a circle of substantial post holes with charcoal stains in their bases. So obviously the, the posts uh, were charred before they were put in the ground to give them extra preservation. A number of smaller stakes at different angles in the hollow, inside and out. Hars were filled with charcoal, as would be expected, and burnt nutshells and fragments of bone. We'll talk about those those bones and what other animals are indicated on the site, which would be fascinating reading when we do do it, so we can sort of work out what life was like. And by looking at the bone record, we can also work out if if they were there all the time, because there's only certain animals that are around at certain times. And if they've got this, the, this bone record, which is consistent with the full season of when those animals are sort of about, then it means that the, the site is being used all year round for at least 100 years. So obviously all this sort of organic evidence is being radiocarbon dated um, and it's, it's been described as Britain's oldest house. But Starcar seems to argue as being older than this historic site. But you know, I tell you, what, who cares? It's, it's quite amazing, isn't it? So what, what we are going to do, we're going to we're going to take a break um, and we will probably understand if this site was used all year round. The clue is in the bones. We're not going to do that yet. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to take a break. Okay. Okay. And Roger, anything you'd like to say, darling? Just wondering uh, about the shape of these roundhouses. I suppose you can take uh, a clue from the angle of the the TP poles, the top poles into the ground, because yeah. the first ones were rather high. And I thought, yeah. well, as I say, from the angle of the TP supports might give you that clue. But all other ones I'd seen later on, they seem to brought it down a level. Yes. And I wonder. Do we have to find any clue for that or long? Well, I, 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 I think the problem is the problem is uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a another image of another site to show how difficult it is to try and understand, um, you know, what what's going on in regards to, um, what what what's what's really going it really going on in regards to. You know, the confusion of finding all these timbers on an archaeological site. It might be a case of try, trying to think as they were rather than modern day, if I can do that. Uh, the, 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 archaeology, just try and think back <laughs> in the terms of the conditions they were in, to yeah. try and sort of simulate something of these at all possible. Yeah, it, the, it, yeah. The, 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 the thing is, because the site was used over a, a long period of time, yeah. Um, you know, it 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 very it's very difficult to really understand uh, where all the where all the post holes come into it. Now, yeah. I, I've I've got I've got some really I've got some nice images after the break as well to give you an idea of the map of of the landscape, and we we're showing some of the Bronze Age stuff as well. So that 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 that'll be useful to have a look at after the break. So. So any 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 anyone anyone got anything else? Um, Andy, anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, no, I'm looking forward to the other bit actually, like the hazelnuts and things. Thank you. Um, and and actually, when when we um, when we do, I, I I've got a clearer um, plan of of the site, so we're, we're going to have a look at that and. Um, it, it it sort of puts everything together and a close relationship with the Bronze Age remains. Um, and this will this will be quite interesting to look at after the break. So, I've got that lined up for after the break. Uh, the, the the actual site plan. So, um, Peter, anything you'd like to say? You mentioned that the um, hazelnut shells were charred. Does that mean they were actually roasting them, or they were using them for fire? Right, Pete. Keep that to the after the break. Okay. Because that's what we're going to look at. What what does okay, okay, okay. Yeah. obviously hazelnuts hazelnuts are seasonal, aren't they? They're they're all good. Oh, yeah. So it is. Yeah, yeah. So, but you do actually have other evidence of of, of other species, like um, you've got seabirds, um, and uh, which would um, seabird bones, which would have evidence that they would be their eggs. So that brings us into spring. So they're there in spring. Anyway, I'm, I'm giving too much away. Anyway, Margaret, okay. anything you'd like to say? 
Uh, I just wonder how uh, it makes sense that they would have a, a, um, a semi-permanent site in the summer uh, when all the berries are growing. And I think the nuts ripen sort of autumn time, don't they? Um, and I, I was wondering about the animals of the time. Animals tend to be very territorial and stay just in one area. And I just wonder if that was so for such as wild boar and the deer, the kind of things that they would be hunting. There, 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 is, there is one other thing as well is, is by, by looking at some of the animals, it's, it's only a little bit of a list, by, by looking at some of the animals, uh, you sort of get an idea what the landscape was like by looking at the animals. Um, and yeah, so... Yeah. I just wonder how many miles they had to go to catch animals or I believe that we could uh, outdistance animals because of the way that we're built. By, by, by about this time, it, by about this time, so you're talking if you round this up to 10,000 years ago, mm. um, uh, by this time, the, the tree coverage would have been there, right? Um but what the temperature was like and what trees would have been available is 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 up for debate. Somebody could argue that there's going to be lots of Scots pine there, hence why they've used Scots pine in the reconstructions. I would say probably not that that would need more upland areas. But but we've got birch and we, we've got hazel and they would have been the species that would have been available back then. Mm. Within, within that sort of within the tree line as it moved north. Mm. Right. OK, Anne, anything you'd like to say? Um, just, a, just a small point you made, which I found interesting, although when you said there was so much evidence, it was confusing and presumably because it's over a long period of time. This this has been there. But usually when you collect data, you're so pleased to get a lot. And yet it's it's not been as easy to use the way you way I understood it anyway. Yeah, the, 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 the thing the thing is. Um, the thing is, right, I, 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 probably the best way I need to, right, okay, you, you, yeah, you, what I need to spit it out is that, um, I, I've seen Roman excavations, right, and, um, when you, when you, when you see a Roman excavation, the archaeologists say, oh, right, we got, we got 500 examples of roof tile, we'll just stack them up over there, we're not going to bother looking at them, right, uh, and we've got, like, um, at Fishbourne Roman Palace, we've got um, tens of thousands of nails. We're not going to bother looking at them. They're not really relevant, right? Um, but they are, but because it's all relevant. Um, this this is the point. When when you um, when you look at archaeology, you've got to analyze everything at the same speed, right? So if you're excavating um, a metallic site in Denmark. Um, you've got to collect the same data. It's got to be done in the same way. So, so you can compare the two sets of data. If a site in Denmark wasn't as thoroughly excavated as this, it would indicate that, oh, there's not a lot going on in the site in Denmark, but there's a lot going on at this site, right? So you, you've got to be very careful with the archaeological data because if you're not careful with the archaeological data, it talks differently. Mm -hmm. It, it's like it's okay, okay right it's like um it, it, it's it's like litter collecting right if you um if if you go out on the street and you just collect like the the packets of fags and and the crisp packets and, and the newspapers right um and say right the streets are clean but the other person does the crisp packets the newspapers and he collects the fags right um then the other person can say the streets are clean right uh, but one of them, one of them hasn't been as thorough as the other one, right? Mm. And so, so the one person's got more rubbish than the other person, but the other person wasn't as thorough. But if they did, if they did done it at the same speed, they could have been compar yeah. compared the data, right? Um, and and this this is this is what we need to do. I think that's what you were talking about. Yeah, thank you for your explanation. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, anything you want to say, Drina? No, thank you. Very good. What about you, Claire, on your own, like the Woolwich? Um, it's, it surprised me when I saw the shape of the building. It, it surprises me how very similar 
it looks to um a pyramid in Sudan uh, about the documentary that I watched. Yeah, because the, the, the pyramid, yeah, yeah, the pyramids in Sudan, they they, they are that, that shape, and they've got like a little porch coming out of them, a little triangular yeah. porch, right? And they come down. No, 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 the, the, no, it's not. Yeah, the triangular porch. They can, yeah, so you've got that, and there's a triangular porch coming down. It's like a little passageway. Yeah, you're right. And it's and good. and the, it's and the thing is, yeah, yeah, carry on, Claire. No, it just surprises me because it's in totally different, you uh, know. Totally different parts of the world, and they're very similar. Well, I, I, I think to be honest with you, that as a basic shape for a building, mm -hmm. uh, and then you have support beams. So what what you're talking about with these buildings in Sudan is is that they um they they are it's basically the same shape because um what what they've done they they've created mini pyramids haven't they so you've got these mini pyramids and then you've got an entrance way um and it's basically in profile you've got these pyramids and it's a bit like that isn't it so yeah. um it just surprises me the concept yeah they, they, it, yeah it's the concept yeah that's the concept and and the difference is the difference is when you think about the sites in sudan the difference in in times about 4000 years yeah that's so, what i mean but but it, it's um, the, the the simplest things in archaeology, right? It's because people wanted to create things simply, and it, it's um, you know, for 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 example, Claire, right? For example, right? Um, what you've got to do in archaeology, you, you've got to you've got to you've got to think simply, right? not comp in a complicated way and not in a masculine way right so what i mean by that is what you do get when you excavate an archaeological site for example uh, to to see a roundhouse right so if you if you take this screen side on you you if you look at the you've got a ground level and you might get something like that it goes around and you've got a bit of a post hole bit of an evidence there and you might get a bit of evidence in the ground of a half bit of a post hole and you've got like a little bit of a ditch around the outside right so some archaeologists could refer to this as a building like this right and then there's a ditch around the outside right but the other interpretation to something like that might be right so if we scrub all that it might be that um you could you could have a you could have that being these being used to rest the beams for example or what we do find on other archaeological sites where, where you've got this type of scenario uh, is, is a, the little ditch around the outside is also seen as a drip line that's being created by water dripping. Um, so there's no ditch at all there. So, so it's all about interpretation. But I think in archaeology, what we've got to do is simplify it. And when you simplify it, it speaks easier. Because at the end of the day, these people are as simple as us. They were yeah. as simple as us. Considering, um, considering in Sudan, they were, <clears throat> well, there's difference in time scales, difference in the countries, and, you know. Building materials. Building materials and but intellectual. Uh, they were completely different, and the buildings look very similar. Uh, for completely different reasons, and and uh, you know, this is this is this is one now. You you've taken us on a tangent, but this is a really interesting tangent, and I, I need to do this now, right? And you you've just hit upon something very interesting, right? So in the problem is in archaeology, what 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 we what we generally do in archaeology, we we put things into categories, right? So um, say 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 for example, um, you you've got. You've got this, uh, which is an atypical um, uh, burial chamber, right? So you, you've basically got um, you've got that, that, and that, and there's a capstone on the top, right? So you might actually think, oh, actually, that's definitely for burial, right? Mm -hmm. But some some of these burial chambers, there's no evidence that they were used for burials at all. So what we what we okay, what we do, right? Um, I, this is this has happened to me many times, right? You you have three men in a room, right? None of them are gay, 
but one guy's got a squeaky voice. The other, the other guy's wearing pink, and the other guy's, you know, not, uh, you know, he's just wearing normal clothes. So you think the two of them are gay, and one of them ain't gay, but none of them are gay, right? Um, it doesn't matter whether somebody's gay or not. The f- problem is this interpretation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just because they all look, look, just because they all three of them look different, right? It doesn't mean to say that they're not the same type of person. It also works the other way around. You could have three things looking the same, and they've all got three different purposes. Um, and this is the, this is the problem with archaeology. You should never ever look at something and think it's being used for the same thing, right? There's there's a, another thing with this, right? There's another thing with this, right? So so what we're going to do? We're going to go. Um, easy stone circle right so obviously that stone circle is used for um animal sacrifice or that stone circle is used for uh, this and it's used for that it, it, it's a representation of the stars it's used for the solstices and all the bloody rest of it right but usually when you look at the stone circle sites everybody says it's all these things right when in fact it could have been none of them mm-hmm. um, lots of these stone circles were actually covered up they were actually buried right um, and it's only because there's been erosion that these stone circles have been made visible. And there's really good examples of that in Cornwall, for example, mm-hmm. where you see the, t- top, the tops of stone circles and you think, oh, wow, they've been buried. And you're thinking, no, they haven't. They were, no, what I mean, they, 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 they've been buried by natural conditions on the top of a hill. Well, that doesn't happen. Uh, material does not build up on the top of a hill. They, they, they've, been, they've been deliberately buried in the first place. And it was always meant to be like that, right? There's been no deposition to hide them. They've always been like that. They've been buried and, and whatever, right? So how could you use that for an astronomical ob- observation post? You can't. It's because things have been eroded since. Um, and it's, it's the same with all of this. What you've got to do, you've got to understand and not understand at the same time. And it's only then that you can allow the past to breathe and tell you its story. Because at the end of the day, we can't tell a story. The past tells the story. And this is what's very, very important. Right, so, okay, uh, Pat, anything you'd like to say, darling? No, nope, thank you very much, it was good. Yeah, cool. And so, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna have that break. I need to get the, um, the YouTube video lined up. And we've got that little plan of hoik as well. Um, and hopefully, um, we, can, we can go from there. So, um, Right, folks, I'm going to uh, take a break. So it, it's uh, it's 8.49 and, and that's where we are. So we'll have a, we'll have a try and have a short break. I'll speak to you all in a minute. Okay.
Did you have <coughs> Pete? <coughs> Pete? You there? Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you have any street parties? In... Yes, we did. Did you go to it? Yeah, well, it was over my daughters, and they were, they've got a cult, they're living in a cul de sac. Oh, lovely. And all the people, we had about 30 odd people there. It was lovely. They did a good, good job. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, they did we well. Had, we had one on our little street here. It was on Sunday, and the weather was a bit iffy. Oh, we had it on Saturday, because they knew Sunday was going to be, wasn't going to be very good. So yeah. they had it on Saturday. Well, they had a big one in Arnside up on the cricket field a, a very big one with music live music and everything but we just did our own little one on Sunday and it was great really enjoyed it had a best cake competition and uh, a painting competition that this is my painting of the queen and the corgis can you see oh, oh very nice <laughs> oh not well done yeah good <laughs> And it was just nice to see all the children playing. Yeah. <clears throat> children that didn't really know one another, but they all got on and just got on with it. Good, playing. good, yep. Yeah, it was lovely. Mm. Andy, Andrew. Yes. Sorry, I just had to put my the, microphone on. Did you get the doorstep canvasser, the woman from Outreach, trying to... Um, yes. Yeah. What did you think? Were you taken in or did you think it was a scam? No, uh, it wasn't a scam. She was genuine and we've now got our fiber optic cable in. Was this a girl with kind of lot shoulder length dark hair? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, I had her on the doorstep. Yeah. And um, she said, who are you with? I said, BT. Yeah. And uh, she said she was she said, oh, well, I'm not allowed to do anything. Uh, if you're with BT, but she said, I would like to have a look at your account. Mm. And I said, well, I haven't really got time just now. And I was a little bit suspicious. Oh, that's not, no, yeah, there was, because there, there seemed to be somebody going around scamming, actually. Yes, yeah. Um, that's not what they said to me at all. Um, she introduced herself, showed me her ID card and said that she was working on behalf of, was it, outreach no it was money expert or something that it was a it was a subsidiary employed by bt um to do it she said we're offering you this because we've been paid by the government and she took all these details she then rang bt um, um, and did and told them all the details and all the rest of it and said i have to leave now they will call you back now 
right. and torture, which they did, and they repeated it all and asked if she had left. Mm. So it sounded like it might have been a different person. So, yeah. Well, the police have said it was a scam. Oh goodness! And, wow. Uh, I mean, I was totally taken in by her. She she saw everybody on our street here. Yeah. Um. And we all thought it was, she didn't have any ID that I remember. Okay. Um, but uh, there was a burglary, at the, two burglaries at the top of our road. Yeah. On yes, there were. On Sunday night. And so people were saying maybe it was linked. Maybe the person was casing the houses. Could be because the ones they they did were deaf. I don't know about the, uh, there's the one on the corner of, um, the gardens and and the close there. I don't know whether they were in, but the people, the, the other one, done diagonally opposite. They're away a lot. So, well, I think it's Kieran and his wife, yeah. his son, live on the corner one. Yeah. Um, they were certainly there the next day when mm. the came round. It was it was Saturday night when yeah. the Jubilee party was on. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. there was one on the High Knot Road done as well. Apparently. Oh, I know. Did you see the police car around last night? Um, I didn't know. I just yeah, saw it. Drove down our road and turned around and went out again. Yeah, but I'm being very vigilant now. And um, I mean, yeah. I don't always lock the garage or the back door, but I will from now on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, they smashed through the windows, didn't they? I, well, I saw they'd broken the, the glass panel at the side of the door. Mm. That's a double glazed panel. Mm. Yeah. I think Ozzy would be a good deterrent. He would just, he would bark fit to burst if anybody tried yeah, to. Yeah, good. But uh, not nice to think, is it? It's a horrible No, thing. no. And it's not like it's an opportunist one that somebody's left a door open. No. It's clearly planned. Well, they've pinched Kieran's car. Yeah. They took the car keys and stole his car. Yeah, that, that if there's a car in the drive, that is quite common. Because you can go in to find the, the the remote, unlock it, and drive off. Yeah, uh, it was a common thing in London. Is they break into your flat or whatever, get your keys, stand outside the door, and press it until one of the cars lit up. Oh, isn't that and then, awful? And then they could put all the stuff in it and drive off in it. You know, in days of old, it was poor people that did burglaries, but now they're kind of career criminals, aren't they? Well, I think the ones that did these ones were certainly knew what they were doing. Yeah. Well, they would, if they were poor, they wouldn't be able to afford the petrol, would they? <laughs> well, there's, um, there's, there's a family in the village who's, uh, whose son has uh, got big drug problems and he gets locked away regularly. And as soon as he comes out, the, the crime spree goes up a bit. But it's not, it doesn't do things like that. It's just opportunist people leaving doors and windows open and things. Oh, what are you doing, Claire? This <laughs> is... I got my puppy with me and she's um oh look oh. Oh. my little baby. I've got my dog with me, but he's fast asleep. Sensible oh. boy. We've had a three hour walk today and he's absolutely jiggered. Oh <laughs> she's 13 what? weeks old. What breed is that? Jackapool. Oh uh, one of the poos. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I feel sorry for this poodle. I've got visions of this poodle tied up in a, a shed somewhere. And it's been had by everything. Up by Labradors and Cocker Spaniels. And <laughs> well, <poor thing. laughs> but they are was, very cute, aren't they? Five weeks old and destined for the dog home. All right. Destined for where? The dog's home. Because she does look like a genuine jackapoo. Oh, oh. All right. You baby. So I had a. Who's that? Who's that? Very cute. <laughs> you look great. <laughs> My baby. What's its name, Claire? Bailey Rose. Bailey. Yes, Bailey Rose. Thank you. <laughs> For some reason, everybody thinks it's a little boy and it's a little girl. <laughs> Bailey's not really a girl's name, is it? Um, is both. Is it Bailey? Oh, yeah. Ba ba yeah, Bailey is a girl's name. Is it? Yeah. 
I was yeah, looking on it. dark websites and I yeah. came across an American one. Uh, right. B A Y L E I G H. And I thought, oh, that's nice. Not so quite a delicious tea. brandy drink then. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god! Right, okay, okay then, folks. Should we get start? Should we get get cracking on? I, I just wanted to mention that um, um, we 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 will um, we will have a flint napping video next, and um, just a bit bit wary of time tonight because it's uh, gone a bit faster than I thought. Um, so we'll do that next, and I just wanted to mention <laughs> that. Uh, uh, as, as some of you will be aware, that uh, by this time next year, we'll only be doing two archaeology uh, classes for Archaeology Cymru, and this is going to be one of them. Well, we're very honoured in that case. Uh, the, well, the thing, the thing is, it, it, yeah, I, 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 I like you guys, well, except for Roger. Um, I like you guys, and um, where is, is he still there? <laughs> Roger's where is Roger? Roger's yeah. gone! Top left is it? He is on my. Screen. Oh right, yeah. No, what I was going to say, I can't. I, I, I can't insult. I can only insult Roger when he's here. <laughs> if, if Roger's not here, I've got to usually say he's a really nice guy. But when he's here, he gets on my nerves, and I don't even. Yeah, you know, I, I wish he. Had, I wish he didn't bother turning up for these classes. To be honest with you, does my head in. Um, and we can't even hear him moaning either. Do you know what? If if somebody slapped Roger on the head now, he'd look like President Gorbachev. No, see, nobody can even hear him. It's great. I, 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 I'm glad. I'm glad somebody put Roger on mute. Anyway, so uh, what we are going to do now, we're going to look at this video, and we're going to go. Um, hopefully, it's going to work. Um, I've not done a video on this technology, so I'm just going to go. Right now, um, you're going to have to tell me if you can hear this. Could you hear that then? No. Yeah. No. Roger, could you hear it? Yeah. Well, well, Roger. Well, as long as Roger can hear it, it doesn't really matter, can, does it? So, uh, so right here we go and go for it. Right. So. Basically, there you go. <clears throat> yeah. It looks like they're using chert actually rather than flint. Mm. That's chert. Chert. Yeah. They're, they're, they're very, it's very sharp that chert anyway. There you go. <coughs> so, <laughs> so they're actually making these re reproductions today. All, all, all the ones in there are, are, are reproductions. So he, he's made them out of chert and obsidian. There you go. <coughs> and and. Yeah. Now, now that that could be said to be a the size of a Paleolithic at. Here we go. Yeah, resharpening. So he's basically mapping the edge now. Yeah. And then he's going to start to do a bit of flaking. It's not actually showing what that thing is there that he's using. There you go. Reform. So we. So he's using the stone to. Um, Give it a bit of a grind. 
Here we go. We'll see. So now we can have to commit. That's going to be annoying. That's going to be annoying to stop. That's going to be very stop. I think the second way is usually to get another thing. We're going to go with another video. Um, so we're just going to go with another video. Um, and we'll just um, hang on. Right. So it's they they seem to be using hard against hard actually. Um, hang on a minute. Um, stone knives, blade cutting. Right. You you learn to flint nap. So here we go. What? What? Right, this is the point I was making with uh, Pete last week. Um, obviously, um, he's just said now he's using modern tools to nap. Um, and um, we've already seen a demonstration of what the stone is used for. But that there, um, in his hand there, is a bit of antler, right? So... It's talking about the proper tool. Oh, when the video's running, we can't hear what you're saying. So, fucked up. <clears throat> right, so basically, um, what obviously the examples that we've seen, um, they're, they're napping using modern tools, but um, if, if you're going to nap, and you're going to use traditional tools, that's when the antler comes in, right? So the, the two examples we've seen today are using modern tools. Um, and I, so obviously you can get a lot more of these on the internet. And I, I would suggest that that's where you go um, to, to get an idea of, of, of some of the ways you nap, nap the flints. So uh, there's lots of videos on YouTube. So that's the point I was trying to make last week with with Pete that the uh, that these these antler heads are being used um, to nap the traditional tools, and obviously you've got a pebble there uh, to try and rough some of the surface before you have to get in with the napping tools. And maybe maybe we could get another another video for next week. Um, I wasn't too sure what they were going to be using, but um, anyway. Let's crack on. Let's crack on with the, what what else we're we going to do tonight. And if we go with here, um, and this, hang on a minute. It seems to have updated a minute. Hang on. We we'll just go. I want to show you this site plan, which we're going to do of our site and the. Now this itself is actually quite clear um and this is the hike site as well and it's it's showing the bronze age kissed burials <coughs> and it's showing lots of spreads of stones and flint um no. and it's showing, it's showing you the mesolithic hut final stage um there were several phases with the mesolithic hut 
Um, this is the one that's six meters across. Uh, are we meant to be seeing something uh, right now? Oh uh, yes, we are. We'll share it. We are. Thank you. I thought I had it on the screen. Hang on. I'm glad you said that because Roger, Roger wasn't. You know, he, a bit slower, Roger. I think. Um, oh. You know, sorry, Rog. Roger, I am picked on you enough this week, so I'm just making up for it. So there, there we go. There, there's shut up, Rod. Shut. Up. There, there's the there's the uh, Bronze Age kiss material. <laughs> Lots of spreads of stone and um, flint. And obviously, this that building there that's six meters across. Bloody um, thing still. What? What? It, you're wobbling it about all over the place. Nobody got a chance to see it even. Oh, God, I tell you, you're not Roger this week, Pete. Roger can be Roger. He's the one who's supposed to be making oh, bones. All right, then. Right. So, right, you can see the kiss burials at the top there. You can see where the, the that's there. Um, and obviously later sheep sheep burials where people just buried sheep there. Now, rather interesting, you know, it's talking about spreads, stones of flint. Stones of flint. So one thing I wanted to do... Is is my other notes in front of me, which is which is equally quite fascinating, uh, in regards to this site. So, where 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 we did get, um, where we did get with Hoig was that I mentioned that we have uh, interpreting the site um, from. Mm -hmm whether it's temporary or permanent. So the interpretation that this was a permanent residence for hunter-gatherers supported by analysis that Hoik is a place where natural resources would have, have allowed all year round occupation. Its coastal position, which it wouldn't have been back then, uh, provided animals, flint um, animals and so on, but. It's still talking about its coastal position. It's, it wouldn't have been a coastal position back then. It's talking about the evidence on the site is that we've got lots of flint. So that's going to be brought in um, from, from the, the valleys and, and, and the coastline, which, which is a little distance away. So that, that explains that. And so also we've got some glacial flint. We mentioned this last week. Um, and you've got wood for construction. So there's lots of timber around and you've got fuel as well material to burn um from the site they got evidence of various fish bones being found and evidence that they're eating seal that there's seal bones so that, that the seals are actually being brought to the site as well there's evidence of the seabirds as well so um you know this 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 thing about the coast it it there's there's it, it must have been away from the coastline back then but it's talking about seabirds obviously seabirds and their eggs. Um, shell fish was actually brought to the site. It's also talking about freshwater shellfish. So that's leading into me saying, obviously, you know, you, you've got, it, it, you know, the, the coastline is, is some distance away. Um, many, and it basically, they're talking about where it, it's a struggle to really understand um, the true nature of the archaeology on the site. And then when you look at the other evidence, when you look at the other evidence, um, it talks about as follows. When you go into the, the local museum, right, which is the Great North Museum, uh, there's a great deal made of this site at Hoik. And it extensively mentions uh, burnt hazelnut shells. It also mentions that on display, there are various microliths on display and there's lots of seashells on display. Now, this, this next thing is, is massively um, interesting in itself, this, this last paragraph on the Hoig site. Um, it's saying that the site was built over at least 100 years. It's again confirming the possible earliest date as 9,800 years ago. Um, the site used for 100 years, successive layers. There's various post holes dotted around the site. It is, again, uh, from the evidence of, wait for it, 18,000 18, pieces of flint have been recovered across the site. 
18,000, and that's with erosion taking place and all the rest of it, 18,000 bits of flint. Now, um, a large amount of, of evidence associated with burnt hazelnuts have been found at the site. Um, and these, these have been found um, associated with a number of halves, indicating that this food group was specifically target, targeted. They were specifically interested um, in regards to hazelnuts. They're also talking about seal meat as well. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, why have they got seal meat? Why have they got shells there? Why have they got fish there? If Carl's saying that the site is far away from uh, the coastline back in the day, um, and all the plans and all the maps show that the site is far away from the coast, but how far is going to be based on um, another another little map that I that I saw a few moments ago? Hang on a minute. Um, hang on, there was another plan. It actually did show it um, some just there. Right, here we go. You can actually see um, that the, the coastline, the, the yellow stuff there, the lighter stuff, is actually the coastline, and it's showing that Hoyk is set back. So that is a few miles away from, from the coast there still, that, that yellow stream there. So in other maps, it shows the Doggerland landscape much further north. It might have been actually by some estuary. Um, hence why that explains why there's all the food there. Anyway, there's, there's different interpretations, which, which, which I haven't got a problem with, whatever one you go with. Um, so it's, it's, it's this analysis of these hazelnut shells um, and interpreting the hazelnut shells is we do look at another site to try and understand what's going on. So we're going to look at the, the hazelnut shells um, from another site to try and understand what's going on at this site with the hazelnut shells, right? Um, it's called a comparison. So we're going to compare compare another site where we get hazelnut shells, and that may give us an indication what's happening at Hoik. But one thing I would say before we, we leave the, the site of Hoik today, and it won't be the last time that, that we look at Hoik, um, is that this this here, right? Now, again, radio, radiocarbon dates from the hazelnut shells, right? The, the evidence at the site not only includes 18,000 flints, we've got ochre evidence, shell fragments and bone. Analysis of burnt bone from the hearth shows the presence of wild pig, we've mentioned this before, fox, birds, Domestic dog or wolf. So if we if we look at the those very animals, wild pigs would be associated with woodland, not being um, near the coast. So obviously we've got woodland nearby. Foxes, foxes might be near the coast, but they could be anywhere. Birds, we talk about a lot of seabirds. Um, this idea of 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 a wolf and maybe they they got the remains of that being excavated positively at the site. So there's lots of really interesting evidence. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to look uh, at the um, at this this other thing. Um, and it's the hazelnut shells. Right. OK, so th this is this is this is quite this goes back to 2015, right? Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get my notes. This is from the island. This is from the Isle of Skye. This evidence of of the hazelnuts, right? So here we go. It says so this is only some of the nut shells excavated from a site on on the Isle of Skye in a place known as Staffin Bay. The remains of hazelnuts eaten by some of Skye's earliest inhabitants were found <laughs> at an excavation on the island. Hazelnuts were a favorite snack of Mesolithic hunter-gatherers. Now we've we've already we've already done we've already been down this, this avenue. And we've we've said that the, the our our people from the Mesolithic period were really into into their limpets as well. 
so there's there's two sets of food that they're really keen on that we've worked out. We're, we're still, we're, this is only the fourth class that we've done with the Mesolithic period. So we've still got a lot to learn at our first settlement site um, at Hoyt. So the shells found at Staffin Bay on the Isle of Skye now date from the end of the Mesolithic period, right? When this sort of... Um, this sort of landscape is being now inundated on the, the east coast and the Isle of Skye at that point would have probably been very much isolated. So if we if we look at this, there's the excavation there. Um, and this is very near the coast, but obviously because it's an island. So there they are excavating. And note the note the uh, note all the um all the boulders there as well. Uh, what are they doing there? And um, what they've got there, um, I, I know this individual from the university, I've, I've, I've met them. So this is soil samples uh, were later examined by the University of Highlands and Islands. And this is what they've done, they've divided. Um, so what you've got is you've got the charred nutshells there. Those are the charred nutshells and You've got lots of um, you've got lots of bones as well, but this is what we're interested in the charred nutshells. But the other thing as well is what you do have is is obviously evidence of bone. So, so in a way, you could think that the that the Mesolithic diet was actually quite was really good. So we have found lots of fragments of charred hazelnut shells in the lower soil samples. They are the ideal fit to date as they have a short lifespan and were a Mesolithic favorite. So when you think about it, obviously, you know, hazelnuts go off quick. So, you know, you're gonna, and also it's seasonal as well. So, so when, you, when, you, when you go, when you compare this with the Hoik site, we've got evidence of seals, which would probably be available the early part of the year. Um, we've got some things that might be available you know, um, earlier part of the year, summer months and sort of autumn. You've got hazelnut shells again, if you want to compare this with the hoik site, sort of late August, September. Um, and you're thinking, if you want to compare this again with, with the hoik site, you're thinking, well, you know, pigs might be rooting around in the winter months. So, you know, and they're going to be easier to catch in the winter months because there's less cover for them. So that's indic indicative that the hoik site might be used all year round. So this is what we're saying. Back to this site on the Isle of Skye, again, doing a little bit of comparison there. Metallithic favourite. There is so much material in the sample in, in the samples that we took that we will not be able to process them all with the current budget. But all is pointing to lots of potential to go back for another phase and include them in that. Now, the, what we've just said there is that we've they've excavated a site and they, they've only excavated a little bit of it. So when they've excavated a little bit of the site, they've got loads of evidence. They've got bagfuls of evidence, right? And again, it's saying here that they can't excavate it all. So overnight, overnight, excitedly, we could say that the, the Mesolithic period is, is, is full. It's full of so many things going on. So we did limpets last week. We, we've got hazelnuts now. We will be come back to hazelnuts. We've got the hoik site. So the, the, the Mesolithic period is massively, there's a lot going on. Um, so we have what we need for now to allow us to date the Mesolithic activity at the site and understand that these Mesoliths, um, the, this Mesolithic period, um, even within a five-day excavation, uh, they've got a lot of evidence. And interesting enough, alongside the flints that they found, they found a piece of bone that's been handcrafted that they believe is like a toggle. So that, that now I've just chucked something in there that we haven't discussed. Clothing. What type of clothes did they wear? They've got a toggle. Um, so that's that's probably associated with some kind of um, coat. Um some, some something going on there yeah so so they got some kind of overcoat maybe that's what the the toggle tells us um so 
again, what we are going to do now, we're going to look at another site, one last site today, to try and understand um, what's going on with these these hazelnuts, right? Um, and if I if I type in, there's two on here. I'm, I'm I'm just I'm wondering which one to do because I'm thinking about time a minute. Um, da -da -da. I just just want to double check which is which is the shortest of the two. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I might might do this one because this this takes us into a different avenue, right? This is about hazelnut shells, right? But it takes us into a completely different avenue again. And this is going to blow your mind. We won't do the other one. I was going to do uh, another site in Wessex. Um, but I'll, I'll just show you this quickly. The, the archaeologist who wrote this, archaeologist Dan Lee, said there was enough evidence to date the Mesolithic activity at the site. So we, we've done that one. Right. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to um, type in... There we go. And... Right, no, no, we've done that. No, 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 it's not the one. Right. right. So what we do, there there it is. There we go, Wessex. Didn't want to do that one. Right. So what I want to do, I was I want to do this one. Because this is going to blow our minds now. So this is sort of about this is um, you know, like a, a mixture to do with settlement and you know, um things like that. It, the, the title of this one is Hazelnut Shell Sheds Light on Life in Scotland More Than 10,000 Years Ago. Again, 10,000 years ago. So, you know, when I was saying earlier on that, that you know, I'm struggling to find people in Scotland um, beyond about um, beyond 11,000 years ago, but at least 10,000 years, we've got stuff going on in Scotland. Right. But this, these dates here are massive. Right. So this site is being excavated in, in Dumfries and Galloway as mid part of Scotland as you can get. And what they've got is burnt shell, they, they've, they've been excavating uh, burnt shells of, of, of hazelnuts, right? And they've they, they radiocarbon dated one of the shells and they've dated it to, now, now this, this is whopping, right? This is gonna blow our minds, 10,547 years ago. So, 10,547 years ago, where we've got a hazelnut shell, one of them dated to 10 and a half thousand years ago in Scotland. Massive, making it, the, it, making it among the earliest known evidence of humans in Scotland. So, so in other words, it's still bloody cold in Scotland at that stage. Um, it's still, it's still, it's still really, really cold. Um, and there they are excavating. We'll, we'll, we'll complete this article. The importance of this site is, is that it, it was used for an incredible period of time, huge period of time. Um, and again, sort of, this was in 2019. Over the years, this site, Dumfries and Galloway, over the years, we have gradually built up an understanding of past human activity. At a site known as Threve in Dumfries and Galloway. Threve, where is it? Where's it written down? Threve. Anyway, it, it's there. T H R E A V E. Um, and so they got Mesolithic activity, which is really exciting. But what they've got at Threve um, is possible evidence to say that people have lived there continually for thousands of years. Now it. They're thinking as well that maybe people lived in Scotland basically smack bang at the time that the ice had melted, right? Because there's another site it discusses here, which is a site known as, um, which, which is, um, there's another site it discusses here um, that takes the archaeological evidence in Scotland to 12,000 years ago. Right, um, and it's quite amazing. All that can be learned from a nutshell. So archaeologists recognize um, hazelnuts as a common food for people in the region during the Mesolithic period. Um, and what, what we do see is as well, is that they're saying, you know, hazelnuts being found on archaeological sites in Wales as well. 
it's 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 given another word as well, and the word that we don't usually use much, particularly in this article about this site in Three Dumfries and Galloway. It's saying the people who left the shell would have been nomadic, traveling the region in search of food and water sources. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that one for once. And the reason why I'm I'm, I'm gonna go with nomadic rather than hunter gatherer, I'm gonna go with that one. Um and again, it's showing an unbroken line of occupation in that part of Scotland going back maybe 12,000 years, all the way into the Iron Age and all the way into all those periods. And, and we can see as well that, that the people within this landscape have, have, have intermingled and, and, and it's just been continuous, been continuous um, for 12,000 years. And I, th I think that that in itself is, is huge. Um, all down to a single hazelnut shell. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to probably sort of um, call that a day, probably. Um, and just say that we've we've we're, we're building up what what we can say. What, what I'd like to do. So I, I want to just do a bit of a recap um, um, from last week and this week. And um, and maybe just sort of call it a day. So if we if we do a little bit of it's good to do little bits of recaps now and again. So we do that. So if I do that and and we do a whiteboard. So what we can what we can work out from the Mesolithic period is is a lot more complicated picture than I basically mentioned. What we do we know about the Mesolithic period? We do know about trees, for example. We know that there's loads of trees around, right? We know that there's people. Right. Um, but we all we, we, we got a bit obsessed with cutting down trees and stuff. But what we're starting to work out is is in this period, they love their limpets. They love their hazelnuts. Right. We also know that they're living, that they're, 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 they might be living in trees, but some people are actually living on settlements such as the site at Hoyk. We also know that we're glazing over a massive part of their diet. So far, we, we've just mentioned seals. We will come back to the hike site again, right? There are reasons for that. We will be coming back to it because we've got to do some comparisons with Star Car. So I haven't finished the hike site at all by, by any stroke of the imagination. So we've got seals, we've got fish. Um, we, we've got evidence that they're eating boar. Uh, okay, and we, we've got... Um, evidence that there's lots of shell, shell uh, mollusks and stuff they're eating. So we're building a massive picture that these people uh, are really, uh, have really got a good diet. Also, we know as well now that they are they are on the Isle of Skye, which is off the Hebridean coastline. Um, Ten thousand five hundred years ago, we know they're sort of in that belt of Scotland, Dumfries and Galloway at least probably about 12,000 years ago, right? So in many ways, what's happening is that people have pushed way into Scotland. And the other thing that we've completely missed out, they're on that sort of area of hike that is now on the Northumberland coastline that looked out in the distance in the North Sea. Do you know, today I'm probably realising that there's something wrong with my interpretation with the site of hike. I'm looking at seal meat. I'm looking at mollusks, and I'm also saying it's 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 away from the coastline, like right back then. And I'm, and one of the reasons why I'm sticking with that, and I'm struggling sticking with it, right, is because um, if it hadn't have been far away from the coast, it would have been eroded away by now. Can you see where I'm getting from? Because it was all been soft rock. It had been eroded away by now, right? So I might be thinking there might have been some kind of estuary there that they got their resources from when seals come in. So that might stick. I'm not trying to prove a theory, but it just doesn't make sense that they were by the coast back then. But you've got the evidence to say that they, that they weren't too far away. So I'm struggling with that. Maybe I might come to it later on. But anyway, so... Um, again, we all do make mistakes, but I, I just need to try and work that one out over the next few weeks. So what I'd like to do now um, is I would like to stop this and I would like to know if there's any questions. Uh, and Roger, let's have questions from you, Rog, because uh, we all love your voice, Rog. That's fine. <clears throat> Follow your oh, 
the position where they were, but that, as you say, will come up later on. Good, good, good. I, I, and I think it, I think it shall, because you'll see other maps showing mm. that Pike is quite some distance away from the sea, yeah. depending on. So, okay. So what I've got to do is I've got, to, I've got to think outside the box, right? I've got to think right. Um, why don't I admit I'm wrong, right? And I'm thinking, I'm struggling with saying I'm wrong, because um, it would have been eroded away by now. No. If it was near the coast um, back in the past, right? Oh. So I'm thinking, it, I'm thinking that maybe, uh, one, one second, one second, what, what, what I'm thinking is maybe uh, we might have some kind of um, <clears throat> a coast. You're gone, Carl, where are you? Mm. You've got screen and no sound. Do you? I muted myself. Oh, it was that bad. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so basically, we might say have the coastline here, right, and hike there, but we might actually have some kind of estuary situation, right? Yeah. We might have some kind of bay situation where seals are going to come in, and you've got the mollusks, and you've got fresh water as well, um, and maybe the plans are showing this. In effect, it was near the coast. There was some kind of inlet, and that that would keep everybody's theories happy. Um, and then event, and it's managed to keep sheltered away. So all that's become a all that's um, all that's been say eroded away. Um, that's gone, and what we now have is the coastline like this. That would make sense. So uh, that that I would feel happy with that. So everybody's right. I like it when everybody's right. Right, so, okay. I don't mind being wrong, but I can't, I, I'm struggling with being wrong. Right, okay, Andy. Um, yeah, a couple of things. The Where was the 12,000 year old remains? Was that at uh, Thave? Or was that another site? Yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, it, no, it's talking about um, not, um, hang on. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was going. It was going within the area of Thrive in Dumfries and Galloway. That, that right. the, there's evidence that people are there, not necessarily structural remains that people yeah, are yeah. within that area. So, so the Thrive evidence, the the the, the, the Thrive evidence. If if I if I may recap to get that right. So let 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 me let me get my dates. Let me get my dates on that. So the Thrive evidence takes us back to the radiocarbon dates of ten and a half thousand years ago. Um, that's the Thrive site, but then it that's the but then it says that they're looking uh, at um, they're looking at evidence in Scotland dating even further back than twelve thousand years ago. That's that's why I it, it's actually saying fourteen, but if it was fourteen thousand years ago, that's before the melting of the ice. <laughs> yes, could be fourteen from now, couldn't it? Really, it'd be still twelve. BC sort of thing. They're getting yeah, my, timelines my are, mixed up. My dates are twelve thousand. Yeah, it could be mixed up. You remember this? Yeah, because that does seem a bit. I mean, those those dates of human remains here were just under fourteen thousand years ago. But that's here, not in Scotland. So. But that's that's a big difference. Um, yeah, but they've got sorry. they've got again they've got the same warm estuaries of the uh, the the Solway, the Clyde, and the Kent. You know. So. Yeah, so it's, it's possible. Um, the other thing I was wondering about is how do we know that the hazelnuts are being eaten by people and are not being used as food for the pigs? Right. Okay. Okay. Well, the thing is, they, the problem is when people say they've been charred, right? Yeah. Now you know this. this I'm, I'm. We haven't done enough analysis today. I've got to be honest with you. But when when it um when they when you use the word charred. Um, and you you always assume that they've been charred because there's something to do with human consumption. Um, and I, I've I've warned you all uh, I've warned you all to think away from that because um, um, it, 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 it is you, you're thinking that um, yeah it, it doesn't necessarily mean to say that they are for human consumption, does it? They could be no. for. No, yeah. I mean, they, they, I don't know. I don't. Uh, pigs love things like nuts. They really do like crunching away on things like that. 
Um, it's possible that they could have, you would actually, you would see probably in the damaged shells if the pigs have been eating them, um, as opposed to being cracked open and be you know, hemispheres if the humans have been in them. So, um, but the charred ones, it's possible because they were using it as a fuel afterwards. But well, they could have just been using it as a fuel altogether because of the yeah. oil. And that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely used by humans for something is probably the safest. Thing. Oh, yeah. So, so we're presu we're presuming that they were eaten, which is the wrong thing to do. Yeah. I mean, no reason why they weren't, but... Uh, I, 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 hang, on hang on, stop there a minute, Andy, right? Because you've actually just come across a rudimentary problem, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, if, you, um, if you burn a hazelnut straight off a tree, right? It's, it's not really going to burn well. It's just going to be green, right? Yeah. If you dry the hazelnuts out and keep them until, say, December, they're all going to be dry, yeah. as you know. Yeah. You ever bought you've ever bought those nuts at Christmas and you open yeah. them and they're all dry inside, right? Yeah. Hazelnuts. So they're usually dry. They they I you if you get hazelnuts in the in the they're, they're sometimes really horrible, right? So if you um if you if the hazelnuts are dry in the winter, like by say December time, they're gonna have the oils and the flammability that you can use in a fire. So therefore, um it could just be simply that they're used as a fuel. And yeah. the other thing as well is haven't we used the word shard to describe ha hazelnuts on a number of the sites, including hoik? Uh, Why are they charred? Yeah, this, this that's the interesting thing. Oh, um, and actually, actually, well storable actually, as well, aren't they? So, yeah, yeah, but if you if you want to, if you, actually, Andy, I think I think you've hit something because if if you go with um, hang on a minute, if if I go with a direct quote from uh, if I go with a direct quote. Um, right, here we go. Uh, yeah, th this is the direct quote, Andy. A large amount of burnt hazelnuts were found with a small number of hearths. Okay. Burnt hazelnuts with hearths. So that's the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah. So in other words, they are being used as a fuel. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, that would, that Very would interesting. Sense. Massive, massive, Andy, massive. Uh, right, uh, Peter, anything uh, lovely? Well, uh, hazelnuts would be such a rich source of, of really good food. I'm sure they would be eating them as much as they could find. Oh. And the, the fact that the shells were charred, yes, the shells would make really good fuel because the shell is also full of oil. And they would burn yeah. readily and provide yeah. a very good high degree of heat. Oh. So uh, yeah, but, the people I being... Being uh, uh, nomadic hunter gatherers, they would they would uh, arrange to be wherever the hazelnuts are, are ripe and ready for picking at any good any time. Select as many as they possibly could and take them with them. Hang on, Pete. You just used the word select. So some were selected to eat, some were selected for fuel because the smaller ones, yeah, exactly. The smaller ones falling on the ground, they're not going to get any bigger. They're going to be absolutely useless. So it's about size analyzing the hazelnuts to work. So it's about selectivity, um, which is using your resources to the full. So oh, obviously, people have such yeah. a good diet. Yeah. It appears that they had such a good diet. That Massive. Oh, obviously, yeah, so that's what we part of that diet, I think, mm, personally. Mm. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, well, we we didn't say they weren't, but obviously, there's other. We're, they're obviously burnt for a reason, and you're right about the shells. You, so yes, so we can we 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 can assume, not assume, we know that the shells are being burnt for a reason, right? A uh, shell, and if if they if they've got if they've actually got the nuts inside because the nuts have gone off or they were small. Obviously, they would have eaten hazelnuts for um, whatever. You, you're right about the pigs. It's all there. Hazelnuts is is a is something that is undervalued when we look at the Mesolithic period, and mm. we we do the limpets, but massive. They may okay, have roasted well, some of them to prepare. You know, to they may have preferred some of them roasted, like roasted chestnuts and things. Exactly. Yeah, possibly. Exactly. Uh, right, uh, Margaret. Anything you'd like to say, Margaret? Oh. Well, perhaps they were always by the coast and maybe as the sea levels rose, they just moved back. Was the tsunami a massive tsunami or was it just a gradual rising of the sea level? 
Yeah, yeah. no, this is uh, actually you shot yourself in the foot there. If if um this 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 is further up north, so therefore the the water level would have would have would have hit this coastline, and it would have destroyed the site and all the evidence. Um, so this so is why um, we've got a problem there. But but yeah, the 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 um the tsunami would have hit the, hit the north because it come from the um was it the uh, Turingum Burger Beta, whatever it's called, no the, 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 the Viking shelf out there. Anyway, anyway, it, that 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 was eight thousand five hundred years ago. So it would have washed. Everything would be under under the sea, wouldn't it? Yeah, the, 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 uh, this is this is that this is why I've got a problem with this being a coastal site. I'm, I'm struggling, guys. You you know I'm the first to admit that I'm wrong, right? And I get things wrong, and I'm, we we come back and we say, okay, that that, that didn't make sense. But I'm really I'm really struggling on this one. I, 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 elevated I, enough to have missed it. Yeah, yeah. But then, then again, it's really it's really soft. It would have been eroded away by now. So I, I'm yeah. just. Like, we're getting too we're getting too lost in wild where for alls. We we have got some good evidence there, and let's just go with that. Mm -hmm. yep. Let's go. Let's go with that. Right. Um. Who else have we got? We uh, um. We we've done Anne. I think have we? No. 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 no I, I don't have anything to ask. Thank you. I I, I think she wants a cup of tea. Uh. Drina, Drina's Drina's actually turned the lights out because I think she's doing something naughty with Idris. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, no questions. Well, you, you don't have to turn your light out if you're with Idris. We, 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 we. we <laughs> at all. We uh, mind you, mind you, I'm, I'm sure Idris would. Uh, Pat, your mic's Pat, off, Pat. Pat, if we leave, you know. <clears throat> what happened to Claire? She was doing so well. I was coughing. I'm oh. I turned my mic. <laughs> but no, thanks a lot. It was interesting. I want to see this Museum of the North, uh, north of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The Museum of the North, they got some really nice things in there now. Let's so, see, yeah. is it in? Right. I, I, hang on. I, I'm, I do believe it's. Um, oh, well, 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 look, it's going to be in one of the. I'm just going to have a look. The uh, Newcastle. Uh, I don't know. Hang on. South Shields. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna have a look now. Um, have, you've got it. Have you Museum of the North? No, I've looked. I'm gonna look now. Museum of the North. Right here we go. It's um, um, right. Okay. Great North Museum is in a place called Hancock. Right. Which isn't which isn't too far away from um, which isn't too far away from a hoik. Oh yeah, you're right. It's Newcastle upon time. There you go. Very good. So I uh, hopefully we've heard from Drina and Andy, Pat, um, Roger, Margaret, and Peter. And uh, if there's nobody wanting to say anything else, uh, don't forget. Um, we we will be um, obviously doing more Mesolithic stuff next week. I'm just going to remind you what it is because it is written in my diary. If I can find my diary, um, which, which I know there's a post-it in there telling me what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to double check and then we will call it a night. And uh, don't, don't forget those that have got the chart on their computer, those that haven't had an email off me, let me know next week. Um, and uh, right, you know, what are we doing next week? Ah, right, we're we're looking at um, a site in Yorkshire, Ready Tom Dean. Don't worry about it. Uh, we're looking at a site in Yorkshire next week, anyway. We're not actually okay, looking, thanks, at, we're yeah. not looking at Starcar. So, um, anyway, Roger, Margaret, Peter, um, <clears throat> and Drina, yeah. Pat, and Andy, I don't have any other announcements, and um, hopefully, see you all next week. Yeah, okay, Cal, see you Thursday night. Hi. Yeah, see you, Thursday night. Pat, see you Thursday night as well. Yeah. So, Dina, uh, yeah. you're off now, Drina, are you? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, no, Drina, Anne, Andy, Bye. Peter, Margaret, Pat, and um, the Pope and Claire, um, <laughs> and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Scandal. Uh, bye. Uh, hey. bye. Bye. Okay, see you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye, bye all. Bye. Oh, and Neil Oliver, don't forget Neil Oliver, Andy. Bye. <laughs> All right, Andy, 
I won't be with you tomorrow. I've got a doctor's appointment. What, in the morning? Yeah, past 11. All right, then, Pete. Oh, okay. So, all right. Okay, okay then. So, right. Okay. I will let everybody know. Yeah. All right, then. Okay. Go on, then. Okay, then, Pete. I will... Um, I will... Um, yeah, I'll see you soon then. Oh, yeah, we're doing tomorrow night, Thursday. Tomorrow. Oh, doing tomorrow, doing Thursday evening, are you? Yeah, six o'clock. Okay. I'll probably see right. you then. Okay, then. I'll see you then, Pete. Okay. Yeah, bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Amazing. Enough. I'm not sure I was in what form there tonight, but um, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. What, what, she hasn't put anything on there. I don't. Take care, guys. Bye.